Let us pray. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I want to express my appreciation to the bishop of this diocese and all of you for the love I have enjoyed since my arrival on Thursday. As some of you know, my relationship with the bishop goes back to December last year. Um, I wanted to come and spend some time with uh, a family friend, my wife and I, and our daughter. And um, I now called the bishop of uh, Southeast Florida, Peter Eaton, and said, hey, Peter, who is this bishop, uh, Central Florida? He said, oh, you know him. I said, no, I don't know him. He said, well, you will know him when you see him. Anyway, I asked him to introduce me to the bishop. And that's how the whole relationship between us started. I came here, had a wonderful time, and uh, we had breakfast together the following day after Christmas. And since then, it's been a real love affair. So I want to thank you, uh, Bishop, for, and your wife, for this love. And I pray that uh, the relationship between us will infest the other parts of uh, the communion to the glory of the Lord. Today is Trinity Sunday. And I want to dare to talk about the Trinity. I use that word dare because the concept of the Trinity is a very difficult concept for us to grasp. And part of this problem lies in how it is presented in St. John's Gospel. Trinitarian theology is very complicated for a reason. The very complication of the Trinity are designed to bring us closer to God. That may sound strange. But there is something we need to know, and it is this. And particularly for evangelicals, this may sound a bit difficult. What we need to know is that we don't know everything about God, but we know everything about Him that we need to know. The Scriptures assure us of that. We do not need to understand everything spiritual or non-spiritual the moment we become Christians, the moment we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And that includes the Trinity. We know enough to save us. So God pours out grace upon us in abundance and consistently whether we realize it or not as his children by adoption. The Holy Spirit, therefore, helps us and his church to which we belong to understand all of what Jesus said, especially what Jesus said about God the Father. Why do we observe the Trinity? What is the importance of this Christian doctrine? In my relationship with Muslims, we don't go into this at all. Because the Quran, their own scripture, actually has a chapter that denies the Trinity. 
talking about Jesus not begotten, nor is he begotten. So for the Muslim, the whole idea is unacceptable. Even for us as Christians, believers in Jesus Christ, I dare to say the whole idea of the Trinity is a mystery. It is, it is a mystery because it is a reality that is above our human ability to understand things. But we can begin to grasp it on our own, but we must really discover it through worship, through symbols, and through our faith in Jesus Christ. And we talk about symbols. I noticed this morning, if you noticed, I'm sure you did as we we're coming in, we saw two of our members processing with the symbol. And I asked one of the deacons, what is that? What does this symbol mean? And of course, she quickly said, it's the symbol of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're talking about. You can conceptualize it mentally, but you cannot really understand it unless you participate in worship, the symbols we use, and you exercise your faith. In essence, the Trinity is the belief that God is one in essence, but distinct in persons. In other words, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are somehow distinct from one another. Yet at the same time, they are completely united in essence, in will, and in the tasks they perform. So the relationship that exists among the three divine persons suggests to us that we can know God through our relationships, not only in God's relationship to us, but to the entire created universe. So in spite of its abstract theological nature, John's gospel has an ordinary down-to-earth purpose, namely, to lead non-believers to Christ. John did not believe that truth consisted of what he had written or that it could be found only in the scriptures. He was speaking of spiritual truth rather than philosophical, historical, or scientific truth which had enveloped the world since the Age of Enlightenment about 300 years ago. So John has given us a method of determining what is spiritually true and what is not true. For John, the fundamental criterion of truth for the church is that it must always witness to Jesus Christ and reveal God's purpose that love shall be of first importance in all relationships throughout the whole creation. And that leads us to the gospel passage that is set for today, that short, brief passage from St. John's Gospel. In that passage, Jesus is here setting the stage for his upcoming death, his resurrection and ascension. We see him here preparing his disciples. And of course, because of what Jesus is saying to them, understandably, the disciples became quite terrified. Their lives are about to take a dramatic turn. They are quite concerned about their future. How will they continue to do his work without his presence and guidance? That 
was a valid question. The question many Christians ask even today. How are we going to do Christ's work in our society? How are we going to make Jesus Christ relevant to our specific cultures in the various parts of our communion? How are we going to care for the less fortunate and spread the good news through that? Jesus, fortunately, had an answer for his apostles. He promised to send another advocate or helper, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will not be bound by Jesus' limitations of time and space. When Jesus Christ was here on earth, he could only be in a particular time at a particular place. Whereas, he could only travel slowly and teach those within the sound of his voice, the promised Holy Spirit could be present anywhere and everywhere throughout the world and, dare I say, throughout history. Jesus, in this passage, knew that his disciples could not face the reality of their persecutions for doing his work. They were too weak at that time to face that reality. It will be the ministry of the Holy Spirit to guide and strengthen them for the challenges they will face. Today, many of us feel they are too weak to do God's work on our own. And in fact, we are weak without the enabling grace of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do it alone. We need the teachings and the strengthening power that the Holy Spirit provides. Let's have a few illustrations of how this works. Jesus tells us that when the Spirit comes, He will guide us in our life's journey. How do we know? It will be the still small voice inside of us that says either don't do that or go for it. He will guide us in the right direction and let us be practical here like your GPS. The new thing I've learned about the GPS since I've been with uh, uh, the Brea family is that now GPS can even tell us there is an accident ahead of us. I didn't know that. That's what we're talking about. Practically, that is what John is telling us. That is what Jesus Christ is talking to us about, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jesus goes on to tell us that the Spirit will lead us into the truth. The Spirit will speak with the authority of God, telling us what God is thinking. The Spirit will give Jesus glory, as we read here, because the Spirit will translate what Jesus has to say to us as we study the Word of God. The Spirit can do this because the Spirit is a person. He's not an it. He has knowledge. He has a will, and he has affections. He also has a mind. So, you can lie to him. It's possible. I was at a bishop's meeting as archbishop of the province, and there was a misunderstanding between one of the bishops and myself to the extent that 
openly in the house of bishops, said, I laid the foundation of the bishop's house where he was living in. I was shocked. And I said, I did? He said, yes, you did. Was I sleeping when I did it? He said, you did. And I was upset. And so I picked my Bible, which I don't do, and I said to the House of Bishops, I can swear on this word of God that I didn't do it. The bishop also picked his Bible and said, I can swear, and I started crying. You think the Spirit was not there? My brother was lying before the Holy Spirit. He was grieving the Holy Spirit. So we can grieve him. And as Christians, we can lie, we can grieve him, we can insult him because he is God within us. The helper Jesus Christ has promised. He never leaves us. He comforts the saved. And let me pause a bit here. When we talk in terms of the Holy Spirit, it is that experience that makes the difference between a believer and a non-believer. For you to become a believer, you have to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And the moment you do that, the Holy Spirit comes in. He resides in you, and he never leaves you no matter what you do. But you can grieve him by doing things that he's warned us not to do. So he comforts the saved. He convicts the lost, because wherever the Spirit of God is present. And that is why maybe you go into a pub where there are no Christians and you begin to share your faith. Because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, if, there, if those people there are non-believers, He will help them by convicting them. And that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, He conveys the truth. John goes on to tell us that the Holy Spirit is the force that gives us energy. You remember the story of the Pentecost. You shared that last week. And let me say this here. For you to enjoy the company of the presence of the Holy Spirit in you, you must have your own Pentecost. It's an individual experience. It is an exciting experience, and it is an experience that just keeps going and going, and it will keep going and going until the Lord Jesus Christ himself comes. The former Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Rowan, in one of his Pentecost letters a few years ago, encouraged Anglicans to pray for renewal in the Spirit and focus on the priority of mission, so that, let me quote him, so that we may indeed do what God asks of us and let all people know that new and forgiven life in Christ is possible. How do we experience this? How do we live this out? And this reminds me of what I read in one of the biographies on D.L. Moody, one of the greatest preachers, Christians, your country has produced. D.L. Moody, from this biography, was addressing a large crowd in England. And in the course of speaking, about what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, he brought out an empty glass like that. 
and he put it to the congregation. How can I get the air out of this glass? How do I do that? And a brilliant person sitting, standing there like you are sitting, quickly said, suck it out with a pump. And D.L. Moody retorted. He replied by saying, that will create a vacuum and shatter the glass. It will. You want to try it? We don't have the time to do that. So there were other suggestions. And D.L. Moody wanted to come to the aid of everybody. So he carried that empty cup and filled it with water to the brim. Holding it up, he said, there, brothers and sisters, all the air is now removed. If I had done that to the brim, that would have been true. All the air is now removed. He then said, and please listen, I want to quote him, Victory in the Christian life is not accompanied by sucking out a sin here and there, but by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Got it? As you Americans say, got it? In every area of our inadequacy, the Holy Spirit encourages us to meet our needs in a way that honors God. I will come back to this illustration very shortly. I say this again, that in every area of our inadequacy, as believers in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit encourages us to meet our needs in a way that honors God. And I want you to underline that word, honors God. He leads us to salvation. He regenerates us, convicts us of our sinfulness, teaches us to live for Christ, and seals us for redemption. Sisters and brothers, the Holy Spirit does not deal with the symptoms of a problem. Just as doctors do not deal with symptoms of diseases. If you ask me, so what is the problem with the world? What is the problem with the Anglican church? The problem with the Anglican church is sin. Sin is the problem. Sins, plural, are the fruit of our problem. Sin is the root of the problem in our communion today. And sin is the problem in the world today. And the only way, this is what we believe as Christians, the only way that can be dealt with is to invite Jesus in and let him deal with sin once and for all. And he does that. Only Jesus can do that. I'm reminded of a small parish church observing the Lenten period. So every Wednesday, the curate, in dismissing the people, he will say to them, Lord, clean the cobwebs out of our lives. And they will say, Amen. He did that for the first four Sundays. There were five Sundays that year. And the last Wednesday, there was an elderly lady who was always sitting right in front. And the curate got up and said, Lord, clean the cobwebs out of our lives. And the old lady got up and said, No, Lord, kill the spider. Brothers and sisters, for us, 
to be effective in mission, for us to grow the church, for us to enjoy all the blessings God has for us in Jesus Christ, we must kill the spider. There is no substitute to coming to Jesus and accepting him as your personal savior. Our world can be confusing. Our communion could be confusing, and it is confusing. And that is why John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 13, from the passage read to us, attracts all believers. Jesus says, but when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. So what we need today is to be led by the Holy Spirit. And you cannot be led by the Holy Spirit until you become a believer in Jesus Christ. And the only way to become a believer in Jesus Christ is not by baptism. It is not by confirmation. You cannot inherit it. It is by coming to Jesus just as you are confessing your sins, accepting his death and resurrection as your death and resurrection, and inviting him to take possession of your life. At that point, the Holy Spirit comes in, and then he will begin to guide us to remember the truth. He will begin to guide us by reproducing the truth, and he will begin to guide us in receiving speaking and living out the truth. Yes, brothers and sisters, the Trinity is a mystery, but not a riddle. The Holy Spirit is alive and active. My challenge is, are you a believer? Have you experienced your own Pentecost? And I pray that as we soldier on, to please and to live a life that brings glory and honor to the Lord. By our life, by the way we live, others will come to know that Jesus is the Savior. Amen.